This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. I talk about um, Primo Levi in the book. I talk about how he describes when he came back from the Nazi death camps, how he is on the train having just been released with his fellow prisoners. And he feels a sense of relief and trauma and excitement that he's going back to his hometown. So the train pulls into the station and his townspeople, who he hasn't seen for years, go to him and see him and his emaciated fellow travelers. And they say to Levi, what has happened to you? What happened to you? And Levi talks about how he starts to tell people of his experience. His words come tumbling out. And as he starts to tell people of his experience, they turn and walk away, unable to metabolize, unable to see, unable to hear what he has gone through. And he describes how, in many ways, this experience was even more traumatic than some of the experiences that he has in the death camp. Because our human need to be seen is so fundamental. And what he was experiencing in that moment was the opposite. So in Emotional Agility, and this comes to the writing, I talk about not only the need for others to see us, but for us to see ourselves. And maybe that's the first step. Correct. It's absolutely the first step. We so often live our lives in our heads and we keep a safe distance from ourselves, from our hearts, from our needs, from our desires, from our emotions. We get up, we go to work each day, we put in a smile, we do our project. And what's really interesting interesting is that keeping a safe distance doesn't keep us safe. Keeping a safe distance actually undermines our capacity to be resilient. When did you get interested in this? Where along the way did you experience setbacks that drove you to this study? What about what about someone who deals with like let's say simmering chronic stress. Like I had a friend of mine tell me she's she's 52, 53, divorced, um, has like low-level jobs, takes care of kids, does, has never achieved her dreams or whatever. Yeah. Her goals are way out of her bounds right now, she thinks, yeah. or she tells herself. Yeah. And she feels she goes through like just constant year after year, low-level chronic stress and, and fatigue yeah. and depression. yeah. So what do you tell a person like that who's got, and then we'll get into the, we'll start this podcast and then, uh, so what do you tell a person like that who's got this kind of low level depression that they can't, and just life circumstances can't seem to get them out of it? So, uh, and that's a really interesting question. The interesting thing about stress is that stress is often seen as being something that is caused by massive life events. But there's a particular kind of stress that in psychology we call allostatic stress. And it's the everyday stress. And often. But some people can deal with it, some people can. Like, I don't even like using the word allostatic because A, nobody knows what that means. And and B, uh, everybody's got some degree of stress. Just commuting into work is stressful. So, allostatic stress, and that's why I use this term, is this everyday low grade is the is the lunchbox filled am i doing a boring job just on and mm. on and on stress and what's really fascinating is we know that this kind of stress is actually quite devastating to us psychologically and right. emotionally um and yeah I, I see just this friend of mine just goes down and down every year and it you can't you know Men, there's always this thing, men sort of problem solve and they don't listen. So I find when I try to problem solve for this friend of mine that um, just very resistant, you know, and so um, you can't talk her out of her depression, basically. And, and so what do you do with someone like that? You're a clinical psychologist. 
Well, one of, the, one of the things <laughs> that I talk about in Emotional Agility is how we get hooked into narratives. And some of these narratives were written on our mental chalkboards in grade three. Some of the narratives are narratives that society tells us. You know, we we like beyond a sell by date. We beyond our sell by date, or we are um, women are not destined for particular careers. And what can happen when we feel stressed in particular is we can start very much living into these kinds of stories, even when they don't serve us, even when it means we go back to difficult relationships, even when it means we stay in jobs that don't work. There's a fascinating, one of the studies that I came across uh, when I was researching emotional agility was this fascinating study showing that when people have lower levels of self-esteem and they are promoted at work, they are more likely to leave their jobs because they've become so hooked into this idea that they only deserve a particular amount that it feels comfortable and it feels coherent, even if it doesn't serve them. Mm. And so this idea of being recognized and rewarded feels so at odds with their mental model that they leave the organization. So it's really important, I think, for people to, um, in these kinds of contexts, is is to actually start really thinking about, you know, what what is it that I value who do I want to be in the world? And to also think about not necessarily making massive life changes, which in of themselves can actually open up a whole lot of other difficulties for people. But to think about what are ways that you can make sometimes small but very meaningful values congruent tweaks like to your life. Like, like let's say the person wants to um, be more creative but is stuck in some cubicle processing paper somewhere. So, for example, someone who is stuck in a particular job, who feels deeply stuck in that job, will often have shut down from even putting their hand up for doing anything else or uh, looking at other ways that they can explore their interests. So they not only are stuck in their job, but when an interesting project maybe passes by or when they have a conversation with their boss, they are not even instigating that conversation or in their home life, they may have developed a routine that is essentially very much around comfort, but with all the despair that that comfort can bring. So, so like they get home, feed the kids dinner, watch TV, go to sleep, wake up, and repeat. One of the things that I explore in emotional agility is the idea of overcompetence, the idea that people can get mm. so comfortable that what they do is they are taking away from their capacity to learn and to grow. You know, it's so funny because that's, and by the way, um, uh, we, uh, we've we been, uh, I just realized we've been rolling this whole time. We're going to get the podcast started, but we had already started having an interesting conversation, so left it in. But um, what you just said reminds me of Anders Ericsson's book, Peak, uh, where he basically says, uh, you know, unless you're constantly improving at what you're doing, doing, you know, what he calls deliberate practice, you're declining. So he, for, he gives us an example. For most doctors, the the day that they're the most knowledgeable at being a doctor is the day they graduate medical school. And after that, they decline because then they just do their one thing and they get very good at it, but they're not really learning about medicine anymore. Yeah, of course. So this taps into this whole idea of these 10,000 hours and, you know, what do the 10,000 hours look like and the whole mm. myth of the 10,000 hours. And what's really fascinating is we know that the human brain develops and grows and forms new connections um, as people go through life. But what's less explored and is consistent with Erickson's work is the idea that these new connections are only sustained. In other words, those cells only stay alive when the new connections are made doing work and doing learning that has greater levels of depth. So, so, so just so you, just, to, just to interrupt there, and I'm a, a serial interrupter. You can so interrupt. I'm, I'm fine with interrupting. So, so this is sort of a, a new thing. Everybody thought your neurons and connections were, were done at age 18. And over the past, let's say, 5, 10 years, people realize neuroplasticity, you know, the, the forming of new connections can happen till the day you die. It happens forever. So, and it's important, actually, for not only from... Alzheimer's, but all the way on down, then it's important to keep building those those connections. So some of the latest research in this area shows that neuroplasticity happens, but when new brain cells are developed, 
they tend to actually die out. So what actually leads to these neural connections being sustained and having longevity is a particular kind of learning and growth. And that is learning that is learning in a way that is deep, that is connected, that is new. So if you do gallbladder surgery, heaven forbid, as a doctor, 10,000 times, you are not doing any more in terms of your real growth and real learning. You're basically doing something on rote in a way that is overcomplacent or overcompetent. So, so we've we've kind of like headed in a couple different directions. Um, I want I want answers to all of them. This is uh, Dr. Su- Susan David from Harvard Medical School, author of Emotional Agility. We're going to figure out how to get more emotionally agile. But uh, I want to reel it back. Again, what 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 would you say to the fifty year old uh, who's in that who's in that office has that kind of low level chronic stress and it is telling that self fulfilling story that I'm never going to get out of that? So there are a few things that I would be asking or really be sitting with this person around. The first is and I'm going to play devil's advocate. I'm going to play that person. You can be a devil. You can be a devil. The first that the first thing that I would ask this person is. Um, Often when people are experiencing some level of despair or disaffection, what they will do is they will often just keep on going. And what is actually most important is acceptance. Acceptance and facing into our difficult emotions, facing into the sense of loss. So I'll I'll accept I'm a failure. Accept that you aren't where you want it to be. Accept the sense of loss that your dreams have been unfulfilled be able to be with those difficult emotions, be able to label them, be able to name them. Don't just uh, do what our culture tells us, which is every day get up for work and put a smile on your face. But let's say say they're already depressed. Let's say they're already beyond the point of putting a smile on their face. The second thing is that often when people are dealing with difficult emotions, uh, what I describe in emotional agility is they'll often do one of two things. The first is they will bottle. And bottling emotions, and it doesn't sound like this is what your friend does. It sounds like your friend does the opposite. So, But bottling emotions is, from from the gender research, is more of a male-dominated strategy around dealing with emotions, which is essentially, I'm going to push it aside. Yes, I'm unhappy in my job, but at least I've got a job. So let me just get on with it. Let me ignore it and let me press forward. This is done with good intentions. And the intention here is I am trying to move on with the project. I'm trying to move on with what it is that I've got at hand. The opposite of that is what we call brooding. And brooding is when the person becomes actually stuck in their emotional experience. Why am I feeling what I'm feeling? This is terrible. This life is awful. Mm. This is awful. Now, the hallmark of brooding is that the person is often not reaching a point where they are labeling emotions, where they are starting to think about strategies or solutions. They are quite literally stuck in their emotional experience. What's fascinating with the bottling and brooding is they look polar opposite. And yet both of them are associated with lower levels of well-being, lower levels of thriving, high levels of depression, high levels of anxiety. So for this individual, if she is a brooder, it does, does it sound like she does more brooding I mean, probably, or does she flip from one to the other? Yeah. So, so what I would be encouraging her to do is to truly show up to her emotions, try get a sense of insight from them. What are him, her emotions telling her? We in society, again, live in a world where we are told to only pay attention to, really, the good emotions. We should be happy all the time. We should, when we're feeling unhappy, there's every which way we turn, we've got advice telling us how to be happy. But when someone's depressed, they kind of have given up on that. They've kind of said, okay, society told me one thing, I've already given up on society. what society told me. But what is really important here is for this woman to recognize that Beneath the depression, there are often signs to what we value. I've never met someone who is socially anxious, who isn't looking for a better way to participate. I've never met someone who's at work, who is angry about their idea being being stolen, who isn't at some level 
concerned or has a value around equity and justice. I've never met someone who is depressed, who isn't looking for a better way to be here, to participate in life. Okay. And so underneath that emotion, there is often a signpost, a signpost to what we value, to the things that we care about. And very often, what we do is we just ignore those signposts. So we we say, gee, I'm in this terrible job. Gee, it's awful. Gee, I wish I had a different job. But we're not actually connecting with our deep sense of what it is that's important to us. So I would be encouraging your friend in this circumstance to do that. I would also be saying to her, what are some towards moves that you can make every day that bring you in the direction of your values. So like what's an example? So, for example, she is maybe, and I don't know this individual, but if you've got someone who is sitting at work and who is never putting their hand up for an interesting project or never volunteering for something that they might find meaningful or never reaching out in different ways, then what they've done is they've put themselves in a box in which they are overcompetent, but they are denying the heartbeat of their own why. They're denying their values. They're denying every way that their body is basically telling them that they need to be in this world and be different in this world. And so instead of trying to make a massive life change, all of us should be, I think, in a way that helps to connect with what's important to us be asking ourselves, what are things that are towards moves? Today, yes, if I value my health, I can go downstairs and I can choose an ice cream, which is an away move, or I can make a choice that is healthier. Values are often seen as being this abstract, arbitrary thing that people have on walls in businesses. But values are qualities of living. Values free us. Okay, so what, what, let's say I'm trying to build my system of values and I want to write them down. Yeah. What are the What are the important... And the idea being that values, as you put it in the book, move you from, I have to do this because my doctor told me, to I want to do this because this aligns with my values. So, And and the wants, the people who want things as opposed to have to do things are more likely to succeed in those things that they want. So what are maybe maybe the most important questions I need to really sincerely ask myself to to build my core list of values? So firstly, recognizing that social contagion getting caught up in what everyone else is doing and how everyone else is living is a massive, massive pull in society. We know that people are more likely to put on weight or get divorced if someone within your social network, even if you don't know them, is doing that. So social contagion is real. And so, so that's like the expression, you are the average of the five people around you. It's it's absolutely. Which, which to, to throw in the contagion word, you're they're, since they're the average of the five people around them, what's affecting you might be people you don't even know because it's the people around them that are affecting you too. Correct, correct. Uh, fascinating work, fascinating studies show if you're sitting on an airplane and your seat partner buys sweets or candy, you are more likely to, even though you don't know the person, because we are affected in ways that we don't even realize by other people's actions and choices. It's so funny because if I go to the movies with somebody, if they order popcorn, I order popcorn. If they don't, I don't. You Same being thing. socially <laughs> contagious. I am I am a virus <laughs> waiting you being, to happen. You're a virus. You're a virus. So, but what's what's really interesting then about this is we can often land up being in a way in our lives where we turn around and we say, how did I get here? I was just going on with the flow. I was just doing what everyone else told me to do. I went to college and I got a job and I got a house and I did all the things that I did. How did I get here? And this is a very difficult place for people to be. What's really critical for all of us is to recognize that values are not some abstract ideas. Values are ways of living, ways of being that we can bring to our everyday. So you ask the question, how do I start coming to a sense of what my values are? Simple questions. What did I do today that was worthwhile? Mm. Not what brought me joy, because often the things that bring us joy... Like ice cream. Like ice cream or like going out to party are not things that are worthwhile. They're not things that we value. If today was my last day on earth, what would I have done that was worthwhile? And Hmm. once we start connecting in with even asking this question, 
we started to become more attuned to our why, the things that are important to us. Now, the reason that I talk about this in emotional agility is not just because it's a, a nice idea that, you know, almost every book you read has something on values, but because what's fascinating is we now know that values are protective of social contagion. That when you, for example, are a first generation college goer, and you have grown up in a society that tells you, and I know your feelings on college, so, you know, but you've grown up in a society that tells you people like us don't go to college. When you go to college and you have your first setback, you are much more likely to have that bias that exists in society be activated. Mm. So you start saying to yourself, maybe they were all right. Maybe I don't belong here you're more likely to drop out. So there's so many society values that are like heuristics we use as shortcuts to protect ourselves. But in reality, for many people to be happy, they have to kind of be aware of what are the societal values that don't work for them. Correct. What are, what are, what are ways that I'm being told to be in society that don't work for me? And when people... It might not work anymore anyway, historically. Yeah, it might, might, or, your, or your values might even have evolved. You know, what you grew up with in your childhood and what was inculcated as a value set might have evolved. But what's really important is naming and coming to some sense of what is important to you protects protects those college goers from dropping out. So there are longitudinal studies that show it protects them. If you in an industry that's a male-dominated industry, you've also very often got this unconscious bias about whether you as a female are destined to remain in the industry. When you have a setback, more likely to drop out. But we know that if people have done this thinking about what's important to them, they're more likely to be resilient. They're more likely to be protected. And you're more likely to be also then able to cultivate habits that are congruent with who you want to be in the world. So so when did you, I mean... This is all, and, and I want to get into kind of more of the specifics of emotional agility. Uh, and there's a couple of, of techniques you write about in particular that I, that I think are fascinating. But when did you get interested in this? So wh what were your setbacks? I sort of find that in general, people write books that help themselves. You know, then yes, they have values that help others. Um, but uh, but first, they're helping themselves. So where, where were your, you know, you're, you're a doctor at Harvard Medical School, probably male dominated all the way through from from beginning of your education to the end to, to to your career now where along the way did you experience setbacks that that drove you to this study so i've had a couple of interesting and difficult experiences in my life uh, the first as you can hear from my accent is i didn't grow up in the u.s i, I thought grew that was up, a brooklyn accent yeah you didn't <laughs> it's like a kind of australian new zealand combined accent but i grew up in South Africa and I was born into a South Africa that was an apartheid South Africa. So while I am a white South African and wasn't subject to the same atrocities as my fellow South Africans were, I still grew up in a society that was chaotic. Every day on the news, you would see people with ties around their neck having been set alight for being an informant. Um, we lived in a society where gang rapes, a friend of mine was gang raped, an uncle was murdered. When I was growing up in South Africa, your chances of learning how to read and write were lower than your chances of being raped. Hmm. So from a very early age, I became interested in how people were dealing or not dealing with the chaos that was going on around them. Why, why, why is it because you were afraid you wouldn't be able to deal with these things if they happened to you? Or was there a fear motivation? There was, there was, there was fear, but more than that, there was guilt. There was guilt. I, like many South Africans, had a nanny who lived in a house. Every single one of my friends had a nanny. And this woman... Anna was with me. She loved me. She wiped my tears and she was my friend and confident and she was like a second mother to me. And I came to the growing realization as I got older, as I turned five and six and seven years old, that Anna was a mother to me and yet her own children 
were not allowed to live on the same premises as her because it was a white designated area. Mm. So her own children lived with their grandmother. And once a year, Anna would go back home with gifts to these children and she would spend 48 hours, sometimes three days maximum each year with these children. And as a friend of mine described it, because this was the common experience, your mother comes back with a pair of shoes and you've waited all year because you are barefoot. And you put on the shoes and the shoes never fit because when she left, you were five and now you are six and she has lost an entire year of mothering and you have lost an entire year of being mothered. And so you grow up in this world of feeling that there is a society that exists and there are messages that you are being told of how things should be. And yet they're just wrong. They're wrong on so many levels. And so from an early age, I was thinking about these things. I was thinking about issues around equity and justice and biases and how we grow up. It's almost like, um, in a weird way, it's almost like you cheated in the sense that uh, you grow up in a society where it's so obvious there was this uh, disparity between uh, the values of society and personal ethical values. Whereas in the in the U.S., I think it's much more subtle, where where societal values separate from you know ethical values, and people debate it all day long. And uh, so, in some sense, you cheated in that you got uh, an advantage over us in the U.S. And that you know clearly that society values don't always match up with personal values. Yeah, you know, it's it's well. I don't know if I cheated, but I do. I do sometimes look at the dialogue well, that goes on cheated, today. You got an no, 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 I get, I get what you got. I get, I got, I got a resilience advantage. I got a, yes. you know, I, I, I completely, you know, it's when you've lived in a society where there is such pain. You know that any dialogue, whether it comes from one side or another, that perpetuates that pain is dialogue that will ultimately leave people desperate and unhappy. So so um, when you first came to the U.S., how did you see, were, were you with open eyes and you saw, oh, these people believe this, when actually that's probably a wrong set of values? No, I mean, when I came to the U.S., I came with a sense of, of relief. Um, mm. I had had a number of incidents in the year before I came over to the US. Like what? Well, one was, for example, um, I had gone to a workshop. I'd been running a workshop and I was driving home from the workshop and I was convinced that I was being followed, which was not a paranoid idea in South Africa. And I arrived then at my house. I parked my car and I decided to leave my luggage in the car Um just to be safe, and I would go into the house and just make sure that the coast was clear. So I waited in my house for about an hour and then finally went outside only to find that, and I still remember their faces, there were two men in balaclavas. What's that? What, balaclavas, it's one of those hats that you can only see the eyes. Uh, so okay. one of those woolen, I don't know what you yeah. would call it here. Um, like a ski mask. A ski mask. So two men in ski masks, these gleaming white teeth and gleaming guns pointed at me. And so this visceral sense of fear because you would be killed. There was no, you would be murdered. There, there was no question about it. Mm. And so this feeling of fear and my response, which I actually talk about in emotional agility, was this really, you know, in retrospect, I look back at it and go, oh my goodness, what I was thinking. But I had this visceral uh, emotion, memory, experience, which is feeling the fear, having these memories of these people having followed me. And I started to scream like a crazy person with expletives that I cannot repeat here. But these guys got such a fright that they ran off and buckled over the wall and ran away. But these kind of experiences, I mean, when I came to the US, I went for a walk, which was the first walk that I had freely been on around my town that I lived in for 25 years of growing up. 
I was not able to walk around the block mm. of my neighborhood. So no, there was no judgment. There was relief and and a profound sense of uh, joy. But then at some point you must have looked around and said, well, why are all these people so depressed all the time? They get to walk around the block. <laughs> You know, what well, led, what led yeah. you to take the steps to writing this, doing the research and writing this yeah. book, Emotional Agility? Well, so psychological habituation is really interesting. Well, so there, there are a number of things. There was, of course, this very profound experience growing up that touched me in very, very deep ways. But I had another experience. I, When I was 15 years old, my father was diagnosed with cancer. And I experienced such a an incredible diversity of responses to this. So on the one hand, I had society, friends, well-intentioned individuals saying to me, it'll be okay. Just be positive. Just think positive. Everything will be fine. But everything wasn't fine. My father, who was the person that I most loved in the world, was dying. And then I had, as many of us experience in our lives, an amazing mentor and friend. And this person came to me as an English teacher. So she was my English teacher when I was 15, 16 years old, and she encouraged us to keep journals. So every day we would write in these journals, and so began a secret correspondence with this English teacher where I would talk about my pain and my regret and my difficulty And she would reply with these heartfelt questions. And what I realized after my father died was it was not the be positive, think positive, everything will be okay that had helped me. That at some fundamental level, the writing, the insights that I got from that, the putting language to experience the seeing myself and showing up to myself and being vulnerable with my vulnerability was what helped me. Let's stop to take a quick break. We'll be right back. You write that even the experience of writing for 20 minutes about your um, vulnerabilities and, and negative experiences and and maybe sorrowful emotions or whatever, uh, even doing that for 20 minutes one day, uh, three months later, there's still positive results compared to the people who did not spend those 20 minutes. How how is that actually even possible? So the, the research in this area is fascinating. And one of the things, just as a precursor to that, because I think it's really critical, is I talk about, and I sound like a complete Debbie Downer here, but I, I talk about um, Primo Levi in the book. I talk about how he describes when he came back from the Nazi death camps, how he is on the train, having just been released with his fellow prisoners. And he feels a sense of relief and trauma and excitement that he's going back to his hometown. So the train pulls into the station and his townspeople, who he hasn't seen for years, go to him and see him and his emaciated fellow travelers. And they say to Levi, what has happened to you? What happened to you? And Levi talks about how he starts to tell people of his experience. His words come tumbling out. And as he starts to tell people of his experience, they turn and walk away, unable to metabolize, unable to see, unable to hear what he has gone through. And he describes how, in many ways, this experience was even more traumatic than some of the experiences that he has in the death camp. Because our human need to be seen is so fundamental. And what he was experiencing in that moment was the opposite. So in emotional agility, and this comes to the writing, I talk about not only the need for others to see us, but for us to see ourselves. 
And maybe that's the first step. Correct. It's absolutely the first step. We so often live our lives in our heads and we keep a safe distance from ourselves, from our hearts, from our needs, from our desires, from our emotions. We get up, we go to work each day, we put in a smile, we do our project. And what's really interesting is that keeping a safe distance doesn't keep us safe. Keeping a safe distance actually undermines our capacity to be resilient because what it does is it doesn't allow us to navigate the full range of human emotions, the emotions that are part of life as it is, not as we want it to be, but as it is, which is that life's beauty is inseparable from its fragility. You've got a job you love until you don't. You're well until you're not. So we need to develop the skills to be able to show up to ourselves, see ourselves, and to be able to develop skills and strategies with our emotions. So what is the writing? When we have experiences, we're going into a difficult job, we're going into a new job, we are going through a transition, we're going through a divorce, we're struggling. It is very easy to keep a safe distance, to just get on with it. But the writing, what it shows, and this is what I experienced in my father's death, is that writing just for 20 minutes a day for three days, when you ask people to write about emotionally evocative experiences, and you then compare that to control groups who write about arbitrary things like the cars passing on the streets, those people who do the writing 20 minutes a day for three days, six months later, demonstrate higher levels of well-being, higher levels of thriving. And fascinatingly, individuals, for example, in studies who have been laid off, when they do this writing, they are hired quicker, so they get jobs quicker than individuals who don't, who are pushing the emotions aside. It, so, 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 so a couple of things. One is, First, just as a basic task coming out of this podcast, if you get anything out of, out of this at all, write for 20 minutes a day for three days or more, you know, what's, what's bothering you? Being honest about it. Like, this happened, this upset me. I, I, I think you can't put too much judgment on it, right? You can't say this person treated me unfairly or this or that. You kind of have to just address your own feelings. Yeah, what what is really important is to not enter into the stage of what we were talking about earlier, which is um, brooding, where you're just doing a big fat vent on paper. The ideal is to start discerning some sense of insight, you know, some sense of um, I don't like what happened, but this is what happened. I, th- or I think this also- is a cause, but not being too judgy about it, not worrying about your spelling, just really just getting it out there is putting language to experiences that can often seem so big and vast and difficult starts to create parameters around that. And that in turn, we know, starts to impact on our behaviors and our ability to ready ourselves for change and action. You know, I, I, just to dissect it a little further, I think, um, and you, you, you mentioned in the in the book, you know, right, talking about anger and sadness and so on. But I think even dissecting anger a little bit, like take your situation with the two guys who potentially could have attacked you. You were obviously angry at them, but you don't know who they are, and you don't know what their backgrounds were or anything. What you what you really could say is you were afraid that they were going to attack you. But more importantly, too, you were afraid that the society you were living in was going to keep you from walking around the block ever. So these are the, you can, some emotions like anger, I feel, could be dissected even further um, and, and more internalized. Yeah, one of the things that I talk about in emotional agility is how people often do the opposite. They become emotionally rigid. And an example of emotional rigidity is when your thoughts and emotions start to drive you. So for example, I'm being undermined in the meeting, therefore I'm just going to keep quiet. Or I'm going to be rejected. Or you're going to be angry at the person who's undermining you. Or I'm going to be angry, you. so I'm just going to... So what starts to happen is we start to often come to situations on almost emotional autopilot. My partner's starting in on the finances, therefore I'm going to leave the room. And, and what we talk about here is this, what I describe in emotional agility, a fusion between stimulus and response, where there's no space. There's this autopilot, the sense of, 
I feel this, I'm going to respond in this way. Being emotionally agile is being able to develop an effective space where you are able to recognize that our thoughts and our emotions have value, but they're not directions. So they're let, data, not directions. Let, let's define space for a second. So um, you're angry at somebody, you hit them, that's no space. You just you have emotion and you react. So space might be you're angry at somebody, take a step back and say, okay, I'm angry. There might be many reasons I'm angry. I'm going to think about it. I'm going to write it down. And then I'll figure out what to do. Yeah, yeah. And I can give some other examples just even relating to the the thing that you were talking about earlier with how we can dissect emotions more, you know, and to mm -hmm. lower levels. Often when people are feeling stressed, they will say, I'm stressed. And then the next day, how was your day? I'm stressed. What they are often doing then and what we fall into a routine of doing is using a very broad brushstroke word to label our emotional experience. I'm just stressed. There is a world of difference between being stressed and disappointed, stressed and frustrated, stressed and angry, stressed and I thought that my life would be different mm. at this point. I thought that my contribution to society would be different. If we keep on labeling stuff as stressed, it doesn't enable us to actually start unpicking what action or what way of coming to that stress might be most effective. So if I was working with an executive who kept saying I was stressed and I was just taking that at face value, I might say, learn how to delegate. And obviously that just glosses over the reality if what is really happening to the person is him saying or her saying, I thought that my contribution and my career would be so different at so, this point. So and this is where you get down to the values. So so what did you do today that was worthwhile? What, what's and he might be thinking that he's stressed because maybe superficially he didn't delegate something, but in reality is he's CEO of a company that he doesn't care about or whatever. What's another question you can ask to help determine one's values? So so we first so so we first want to show up to that emotion. We first want to start saying what is this thing that I'm calling stress or what is this thing that I'm calling anger? What are two other options? What else might be beneath here? Another thing that we want to start doing is we want to start creating a healthy space between us and our emotional experience. In emotional agility, I call this stepping out. The ability to recognize that who's in charge here, the thinker or the thought? Who's in charge? My emotion or me, the person who is big enough to contain all of my emotions. And this is part of what's basically creating that space. When you start to disengage yourself from the actual emotion and realize that it's not you. Yeah. So you, you might be feeling anger, anger, but you're not anger. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. So you are, and you're not, you're not ignoring the anger. You're noticing it, but you're not over identifying. Because mm -hmm. of course, when you say I am angry, I one hundred percent of me is angry. If you even start doing something as simple as saying, I'm noticing that I'm feeling angry. Mm. I'm noticing that I'm feeling undermined in this meeting. I'm noticing the urge to shut down. What you're doing is you're starting to create what in psychology we call the meta view, the ability to both feel an emotion or think a thought and to simultaneously helicopter above it where you, we've all been in this experience, you phone a customer service agent and you're super angry, frothing at the mouth, and you want to just yell at the person down the phone. But there's that voice in your head that says, if you yell down the phone, they will conveniently lose your file. And so we all have that ability to feel an emotion, but to also helicopter above it. Mm -hmm. And in emotional agility, I describe some of these strategies around labeling emotion, around being able to create this healthy distance that then allow you to say, who do I want to be here? What value do I want to bring to the table? How do I want to be living my life? What is important to me? And a very simple example might be, I am feeling undermined, therefore I'm going to shut down. There's no space. I'm noticing that I'm feeling undermined and I'm noticing the urge to shut down. Mm. But my value, who I want to be as a person, as a leader, as a parent, is to continue contributing. And I can make a choice then to move that action forward within the moment. What if, what if somebody is really, like when you say to them, 
what what their values are. Let's say what what are what are my values as a parent? What a what if I really don't know? Like how do I discover these things about myself? So that is not an uncommon experience. A lot of us again live on autopilot and in a crazy world I've got an eight old and a three old and things get so busy that we often forget to even make space to think about what is important to us. And so this process of inquiry then becomes all the more important. Sitting down and actually thinking about, what, you know, what is critical to me here? What is critical? And sometimes these things are so small but so important. So, for example, for me, the idea of being a present parent is critical. It doesn't mean that I don't work or that I don't have other activities that are enjoyable. But what it does mean is that when I'm with my child, I want to be present. Now, like all of us, we can get into habits where we are with our child, but we also on our cell phone and we surfing and we Facebooking. And so what we've done is we've gotten into an autopilot, again, autopilot response that is taking us away from the very person that we want to be in that situation. So in emotional agility, I talk about ways that we can start building habits that are values aligned. So in this example, I might have a habit where I automatically come home from work and I put my keys in a particular drawer. And we know that we can cultivate habits when we piggyback a new habit onto a pre-existing habit. So I already put my cell phone in the, I already put my keys in the drawer. Now I develop a habit that is also putting my cell phone in the drawer. So what we're doing here is we are starting to recognize what our values are, where we are making moves that are away from those values, and how we can make tweaks, small changes that are values aligned and that can really be freeing. You know, it's funny because uh, you talk also about uh, eating and diet a little bit in the book, and you mentioned specifically that we essentially clear our plates um, no matter how big the plate is. So if you buy plates that ten that are ten percent smaller, you know, if you change it, you don't even have to change the habit. Just simply buy plates that are ten percent smaller. You'll eat less and lose weight. Yeah, yeah. What I was what I'm doing in that chapter is I'm I'm talking about how and it's such an important aspect that you bring up. I'm talking about this idea that we we when we are stressed, when we are time poor, we often devolve to being the very people we don't want to be. So we'll overeat or we'll not be present or we'll uh, you know not do things that are congruent with with um, our intention. So this is where habits come in. If we've got a sense of who we want to be and how we want to live, whether it's at work or at home, and then we start cultivating an environment that is congruent with that, what that does is it means that when we are stressed, so we come home from work and we are exhausted, but we are trying to eat in a more healthy way, there's fruit on the table right in front of us. So it becomes a less um, difficult time to experience our habits effectively because when, when we're under stress, we know that's often when we devolve to the very things that we don't want to be doing. So it's, it's almost like not only building habits, which could be may or may not be difficult, but also making sure that you know the people that you're around also have good habits. So it's easier for you to just fall back and they're catching you with their good habits. And, or the environment that you live in, maybe don't have all the chocolates lying around, instead have fruit lying around. Like kind of set, when you're in a good spot, kind of set everything up, uh, friends, location, job, when you can, if you can, kids, whatever, uh, so that it's easier to fall back onto the good habits when we're on autopilot. Yes, yes, because when we are stressed and when we are time poor is when our very intentions fall by the wayside. So if we can create habits, and what's critical here is the habits need to be values aligned, 
habits that we are trying to change, whether they're health habits or any other habit that we're trying to change, but that are not fundamentally connected with what's important to us. So we're doing them out of a sense of obligation. You know, my doctor's at me to lose my gut or my wife is at me to lose weight. And so this is what I call a have to goal. A goal that is done out of a sense of obligation or shame is less likely to be a successful change, a successful habit, than one that is cultivated out of a sense of want to, so, so intrinsic the, desire. And those want tos, it's almost the same as putting your cell phone with the keys. So the want tos come from setting up a set of values that you can fall back on when you go into autopilot. Yeah. One of the studies that I came across that was just amazing was this uh, piece of research that really looks at the, the physics of willpower. So you'll hear people talk about, I don't have willpower or I've got really bad willpower. But what's really fascinating and going back to the example you were talking about with, say, trying to lose weight is... So imagine you are trying to lose weight and you've got a have to goal. I'm trying to lose weight because everyone's at me. It's a sense of obligation and shame. You go to the refrigerator and you open that refrigerator and say there's a piece of chocolate cake inside the, that refrigerator. I'm eating that cake. You're eating that cake. What's fascinating is that willpower doesn't even come into it. Your brain, our brains, process taste attributes 195 milliseconds sooner than you even know you are making a choice. So your brain knows whether you are eating the chocolate cake or not before you even start saying, should I or shouldn't I? Now, what's really interesting is that is um, when you've got a have to goal, we know that you open that refrigerator, temptation actually is ramped up. The only thing you see in that refrigerator is the very thing you can't have. Our brains rebel against being constrained. Now take that same goal. Imagine your goal is a want to goal. A goal that is driven by an intrinsic desire to see your children grow up and therefore you want to be healthier. A goal that is much more around that intrinsic desire, you go to the refrigerator and Yes, you see the chocolate cake, but the physics of willpower are actually altered. Temptation ramps down. You see the chocolate cake, but you also see a whole lot of other options in the refrigerator. And you're much more likely to make a choice that is congruent with your ultimate goal. So how, how is that um, connected in the sense that is, is ha- having these intrinsic values um, rewiring the brain so that now... Uh, I'm noticing the other things as quickly as, as, as I'm noticing the cake? or So there, there are different reasons for this. There's, there are a number of reasons for this. But one is that when you are feeling a sense of obligation, often what it does is it uses cognitive resources. So you, in a struggle with yourself, you on the one hand have got this thing that you feel that you have to do. And then on this other on the other hand, you've got this thing that you actually are rebelling against doing. And so your mind is quite literally in an internal tug of war. Mm. I see. So so if you're experiencing any kind of willpower depletion at that point, your your brain's going to lose to what the evolutionary defaults are. But if there isn't um, this war happening, you're much more likely to... Um, you know, not you know, not give in to the evolutionary needs for sugar and and fats and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, in general, what we know is that when you have constructed a sense of what you want to do and why that thing is important, that it is freeing and centering, and it helps you to make effective choices. And I give that example specifically at home, for example, with health. But we all do this. We trap ourselves into language around have-tos. I have to have this difficult conversation. I have to be on parenting duty today. And what we sometimes do is we forget that in our have-tos, there is actually very often an underlying true want to. I value fairness And having this difficult conversation is actually something that is fair both to the employee and fair to the organization and fair to me and fair to the rest of the team. Parenting duty, I 
chose and I truly value being a parent. But so often we trap ourselves into subtleties of language that stops us from actually being able to bring what is truly important to us to the surface. And then what happens is we start developing a sense of resentment and tug of war and rebellion against the meeting or the parenting duty, you know, if we start using that phrase. Right. So we get angry at ourselves and then we feel stuck and it just cycles down. Yeah. Tell me about uh, grit, which is also eloquently described in the book, Grit by Angela Duckworth, but you, you talk about it in a slightly different way in emotional agility. So the first thing with grit is that emotional agility, the ability to be able to show up to your feelings, feel the feelings and discern a sense of value from them, actually helps us to be more gritty. And, and what is gritty? So gritty, Angela defines it, and I, you know, will go with her definition. She defines it as having passion and perseverance. So it's this idea that you feel very passionate about something, and therefore you are persevering with it. So emotional agility helps us to be gritty. But I love the phrase, and I didn't use it in the book, but one of the things that I talk about is something that Scott Belsky from 99U actually talks about. It's this idea of being stubborn is fine, but stubborn, not stupid. So I think sometimes what happens is in the service of grit, we can lose sense of whether the goal that we are being gritty about actually still serves us, whether it is actually connected with who we want to be. We know, for example, when people have invested a huge amount of time into a career or into a particular job, that sense of sunken cost that you've, you've sunk so much time and energy into it becomes a very strong pull to keep you in that career or in that job, even if it is no longer serving you. So in, in Grit, she sort of shows that having that capability of that perseverance will help you succeed more in that career. But you're perhaps saying that, heck, maybe you wanted that maybe that career wasn't worthwhile to you. It wasn't a worthwhile value to you. Maybe you should be in a, you know, maybe grit's leading you the wrong way. Yeah, one of the most critical capabilities in us as human beings is to be able to adapt. The world is changing. Our needs change. Our circumstances change. We cannot be so focused on a particular goal, a particular career, a particular idea of ourselves and who we are, that we lose our capacity to be agile and adaptive. So yes, by all means, we need to be able to be gritty with things that are values aligned, with things that are congruent with who we want to be in the world. But we also need to know when to quit. And in the book, I lay out examples of questions that people can ask themselves around sunken costs. You know, have I invested so much in this that this is actually the pull in keeping me in a place that I don't want to be? And that, that's part of this uh, building this space between the feeling of should I persevere as opposed to really taking a step back and does this align with my values? Correct. Correct. So, so what else? What's another technique uh, I can use in my own life? I want to... I want to get better. A gritty technique or a different something else? I want to be more emotionally agile. So a critical part of emotional agility is um, this, this part of showing up. And one of the pervasive ways, and I alluded to it a little bit earlier, but is so profound in our society, is this idea that we need to be happy all the time. That right, so it's all these BS kind of self-help books, power of positive thinking, the secret, all this stuff. I'm definitely throwing them under the bus, like they're all useless. But yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm not anti-happiness. I'm a I'm a very happy person, and I in one part of my career a couple of years ago wrote actually a book called the Oxford Handbook of Happiness, which is an eighty chapter book on how we effectively cultivate human happiness. But what's really interesting is I think that this idea that we should all be happy all the time is in a paradoxical way making us less resilient and is making our children 
less resilient. There's too much pressure on being happy or else you failed. There's there's a huge pressure to be happy. And what's really interesting is that people who have a goal around being happy over time actually become less happy because what are they doing? They are very often then pushing their difficult emotions aside. They are not learning from their emotions. They are not learning the values that are underneath their emotions. They are often starting to engage in what we call type two thinking. Type one thinking is where you say, I'm worried or I'm unhappy. Type two thinking is when you start layering in thoughts about your thoughts. I'm unhappy and I shouldn't be unhappy. Or I'm worried and I shouldn't be worried. So what you do is you start... You know, there, there's a funny um, uh, example or, or metaphor to this. And I think, I think Buddha said this, is that uh, the first arrow will wound you, but the second arrow will kill you. So the thought of I'm unhappy uh, will hurt you, but... Uh, you know, thinking I, I, I'm unhappy and I shouldn't be, uh, and it's this person's fault. And that will kill you. Yeah, what we do, what we do is we start engaging in the equivalent of psychological quicksand. The the more we struggle, the deeper we sink, and often, actually, in order to develop our happiness. The first thing is to not be focused on happiness as a goal, but to start pursuing activities that are intrinsically interesting to us and intrinsically um, aligned with who we want to be. Happiness then comes, but it comes not as an objective, as a byproduct rather, it will come. So it's, it doesn't come in as an objective, it comes as a byproduct. Another just final, if we're talking about happiness and if I'm getting indignant, is I also think that at some level, this dialogue about happiness starts to make people culpable or feel culpable for their own unhappiness. Mm. So there is no doubt, and one of the things that I found found most interesting when I was writing um, this book on on happiness, this this academic book, is when someone lives in a community that is two hours away from public transport. And so they are commuting maybe two or three hours a day and they are in a low-level, low-paying job and feel fundamentally trapped. And then we as society say, oh, if you're unhappy, just choose to be happy. I think what we do when we have that kind of dialogue is we are ignoring the very real circumstances and social policies that can and do impact on people's well-being. Because the messaging for that is, well, if you're unhappy, it's your choice. You can just choose so, so to be happy. This relates actually to the very first example we spoke about, which is someone who has chronic stress for a reason. Maybe they have the two-hour commute and they can't move. What what should they do? What's the very next thing they should do? Okay, they could journal it to, to some extent, 20 minutes a day, and talk about being unhappy, and this is not where they thought their life was going to be. But what else? So there are, I think for, for individuals, there still will be the capability to make changes to your life. You know, are you coming home from work and turning on the TV? Are you um, engaging in a way of being where you're not exercising or when where you, you aren't doing things in the time that you've got that feel that they're filled with quality? Mm. So I think that there are absolutely, but I think really, you know, when I'm talking about this happiness um, dialogue that's happening, I think what it does is at some level, it it points fingers at people who are unhappy and it basically says to them, it's all your fault. You should be thinking differently. A a friend of mine recently died of stage four breast cancer and she called this the tyranny of positivity. Mm. She said to me, if it was just a case of thinking positive and being positive, which is what everyone around me with brilliant intentions was telling me, all of my friends in my breast cancer support group would be alive today. They were the happiest, positive thinking people that I know or that I knew. And by telling me that I just need to think positive and be happy, what it's doing is it's making me at some level feel culpable 
for my own death. That if I die, it's because I didn't engage with the law of attraction, the idea that I could have brought health and well-being to myself. And what she said to me is, and it struck a chord because it connected with something that I'll tell you next, which relates to my own personal experience, is she said to me, what this narrative does is it takes me away from being real. It takes me away from the authenticity of my experience. Life's beauty is inseparable from its fragility. And when I am having conversations with my family and everyone's telling me to be positive, it stops me from having the real conversation that I need to be having with them, which is that I love them Mm. and that I care for them. So my own experience with this, which is very personal and didn't make it into the book, is because it was too painful to, to write about at that time, is my father, when he was diagnosed with cancer, there was no doubt about the fact that he was going to die. And he had been paying life insurance for decades. He was diagnosed with cancer, and in the trauma and terror and desperation, he knowing that he was going to die, cancelled his life insurance, leaving three children, me and my brother and my sister, as well as my mom, in chaos and debt. And the reason he did this, and this was again done out of a sense of misguided terror and desperation, was him somehow at some level feeling that having life insurance, and I know this is an extreme example, but having life insurance was a sign of a lack of faith Mm. that he would get better. So you asked me about my history and my interest in emotions. Part of it comes from this whole experience of what are ways that we can go against who we want to be as as parents and who we want to be in the world and how we want to come to the world when we turn our backs on our emotions and our feelings and our capacity to be resilient and effective with ourselves. So let me ask you, why didn't you include that in the book? Because it is such a strong example of, of what you're saying. Why didn't you start the book with that? Wouldn't that have been a great start to the book? Oh, you're saying you didn't like my start? Oh, I love uh, you your like start. start. But no, I'm I love teasing. your start, I'm but I'm, I'm just saying it's, you know, it's interesting. It, was, it bleeds. It was, no, it, it was really interesting. When I was writing the book, I was also... I, I didn't do a lot of reading while I was writing because I, when I'm writing, prefer just to focus mm-hmm. on what it is that I'm trying to write as opposed to comparing to what everyone else is talking about. But I listened to a very beautiful podcast um, in which Brené Brown spoke about the idea that stories that you tell the world are best when they are stories that you have come to terms with in your own mind. Mm. Because otherwise what you do is you tell the story to the world and how the story then gets reflected back by others, other people's reactions and whether people tell you you were wrong or right, then become part of your defining process and your capacity to um, integrate that story effectively and to process that story effectively. And so the reason I didn't start, it was a conscious choice. The reason I didn't start the book with that was because that was a story that was so painful And it was a story that I was still trying to come to terms with. And in fact, it was only after writing the book and then speaking with this friend of mine who then died of breast cancer who described this feeling of terror and how it can impact on people's thinking and reasoning and then discussing with my mother about what that was like for her helped me then, it's again, get the language around what had happened and the processing of it in a way that I now feel integrated with that story. It feels whole and a part of me. So so in a sense, writing this book was a little bit, you know, you're journaling through these negative experiences. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Part, you know, partly, as I say, I'm a happy person, but I think all of us have experiences in different ways, failures and setbacks and sure. traumas or transitions or divorces that we need to be able to navigate and bring into the wholeness of who we are. I think I've had all of the above, so I could definitely... The, the, book, was, the book was great, and I definitely benefited from reading it. I also liked how you integrated so many other books that I've, that I've read and studied. You know, you mentioned uh, Mindset by Carol Dweck. You mentioned Grit by Angela Duckworth. Well, great. Well, Dr. Susan David, the book is Emotional Agility. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast and answering all my flood of questions. So uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been fascinating. For more from James, check out the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network at jamesaltucher.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today. Hey, thanks for listening. Listen, I have a big favor to ask you and it will only take 30 seconds or less and it would mean a huge amount to me. If you like this podcast, please let me know. Please let the team I work with know. Please let my guests know. And you can do this easily by subscribing to the podcast. It's probably the biggest favor you could do for me right now. And it's really simple. Just go to iTunes, search for The James Altucher Show, and click subscribe. Again, it will only take you 30 seconds or less. And if you subscribe now, it will really help me out a lot. Thanks again.